Okay, so now we are starting a new chapter. So today is going to be our intro to statistical uh, mechanics or statistical thermodynamics is what the book is labeled because it only deals with equilibrium problems. So in terms of a brief history, uh, StatMech sort of came into life in the late 1800s <clears throat> as a way to unify the fairly mature and developed field of classical thermodynamics with the new concept of an atom, right? So the earliest known sort of support, like concrete either mathematical or experimental support, came sort of, I think, 1880s. Uh, from uh, Boltzmann, right, who used it to predict the properties of steam. Uh, and the first really concrete, rock-solid experimental evidence uh, for the structure, or for the, for the existence of an atom uh, came, I believe, in 1904 or 1905 uh, with the discovery of Brownian motion. Right, so there really was no good way to describe Brownian motion if there were not little teeny uh, atoms bouncing around little pollen beads. Uh, and so that was a really important time. So if we think about it historically, the notion and the theory and the concept of an atom is a fairly modern idea. I mean, Greek philosophers were talking about it thousands of years ago, but they didn't have any evidence for it, right? They just assumed that if you divided something enough, you'd probably reach some end point. But uh, in terms of mathematics and thermodynamics, there really wasn't ever a need to concern ourselves with an atom because we had macroscopic thermal that worked fairly well, assuming an arbitrary continuous fluid, uh, but, and also that we didn't have any techniques that we ever could see it, right? So Boltzmann's prediction of how big an atom should be was far lower than we could ever, ever hope to see, and so they'd probably be quite surprised now that we can visualize them with electron microscopy and things like that. But anyway, so the idea behind StatMech is to unify what a atom is and how an atom behaves with the well-established field of classical thermodynamics. So what we're trying to relate between here is a microscopic picture to a macroscopic one. Right? Micro meaning atoms or you know something on the microscopic length scale, very, very, very small. And for macro, anything on the continuum scale. Right, what we would consider the bulk properties of a fluid, like water or something like that. And so we're going to first start off with is talking about the time scales involved and the length scales involved with uh, the microscopic length scale or the atomic length scale or molecular length scale. So if we think about pressure, we know now, because we're exceptionally well educated, uh, based especially on our, you know, 1800s counterparts, uh, we know now that pressure is a result of molecular wall collisions, right? You have a molecule that hits a wall, a lot of those add up, and that gives you a macroscopic time averaged measurable pressure. But in reality, every single time a molecule hits a wall, that is a discrete event that transfers a little bit of energy or pressure or force onto that surface. So if we're dealing with a system at, let's just say, near ambient conditions, around 300 Kelvin, that means the energy, the average kinetic energy of a molecule in a gas is provided by, and I use this term O, like for the order of, KBT, right, where KB is the Boltzmann constant. And the Boltzmann constant is a way to relate between the temperature and the energy based stored in the kinetic energy of a molecule. The Boltzmann constant is equal to the ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So the gas constant tells us the same thing, right? It tells us how much kinetic energy is stored in a mole's worth of gas. The Boltzmann constant is the one-to-one -one analogy. So if you can't remember what the number is, like I can't ever do, I just take Avogadro's constant 
you know, and divide you know, R by that. <clears throat> so that basically means that the energy of every collision is on the order of 10 to the minus 21 joules. And this is because the Boltzmann constant is on the order of 10 to the minus 23. In fact, I believe the true number is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 3, 23. And our temperature is on the order of 10 to the second power. It's between 100 and 300. This is order of magnitude analysis we're working through. So very, very small amounts of energy are involved in these particle wall collisions. However, there are a lot of molecules, and they move very fast. So we have the number of collisions is on the order of 10 to the 24 per second per square centimeter. So that is a trillion trillion collisions per second per square centimeter, or a million, 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 million. A lot. 10 to the 24. So by combining all of these two, right, we can get finite pressures, something that's measurable or appreciable, or something that we can feel or sense. So what we would like to do like to ideally find a way to just keep track of every single particle and then we could use it to calculate everything right as long as we know the rules of how a single particle behaves we can just track them all and find a way to mathematically accomplish this task problem is <clears throat> as you can probably guess this is exceptionally complex so one mole is on the order of 10 to the 23 particles. Each one of these particles collides every 10 to the minus, on the order of every 10 to the minus 11 seconds. So this is 10 pico seconds. Tens minus 12 is pico. So therefore we have on the order of 10 to the 33 collisions per second for one mole of gas. So I usually, I usually like to check what the current world's most powerful supercomputer is. And they, they, they measure these things in what they call flops, floating point operations per second. Anyone have to know off the top of their head how many flops can be done? I don't remember what it is. I think it's on the order of maybe billions or trillions of flops. So you can do, a, the world's most powerful computer can do like maybe a, a trillion calculations every second. So that's 10 to the 12, but we've got 10 to the 33. So even if every single one of these particles only had to have one calculation every second, it would take us basically an infinite amount of time to, to simulate one mole of the system. <clears throat> So in reality, this approach where we're trying to actually simulate where the particles are and how they're moving is exactly what we call molecular dynamics or molecular simulations.
they have to do it on a significantly smaller scale. In fact, molecular simulations is something relatively new within the past 40 or 50 years, and likely so within the past about 20 years has it really exploded into a really prolific type area. STATMEC predates that. So in a typical molecular simulation, there's usually on the order of 10,000 to a million, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6, particles in a particular simulation box. Every single one of those particles has a set of rules or behaviors or how its forces interact with one another, how it rotates, how it vibrates. <clears throat> Basically, kind of think, I like to think of it just like a, like a little game, right? There, every single particle is following the rules of the game that it's stuck in. But if we look at the time scale that we want to run these simulations for, if you wanted to do a simulation on the order of picoseconds, well, this is fairly routine. And there's software out there that's commercially available where you can just draw a molecule, hit run, it'll spit out its macroscopic properties after a few picosecond simulation. So for a pure, volatile, light, low molecular weight fluid, not a big deal. Right? The accuracy of the rules of the game is another question. If we want to simulate something on the order of nanoseconds, so any sort of a behavior of a macromolecule, like a protein or a high molecular weight compound, right? This is going to be uh, relatively common, but a bit more difficult. Something that you'll likely want to have a, a student or a PhD student work on for, you know, at least a year or so to really fully explore uh, what are the consequences. Now, if we want to get even to the order of microseconds, These types of simulations are sort of reserved for researchers who are very highly specialized in their particular research topic, and you do not get many microsecond scale simulations. So for example, a couple of years back, uh, there was a paper in, I think, Science or Nature that did micros microsecond simulations of gas hydrate formation. Right, how do water molecules freeze around a, moder a water molecule? So if you can do a good microsecond simulation that has really high impact, I mean, we're talking very high level research type discussions. And so you're, you're occupying supercomputers for months on end to accomplish a microsecond simulation. But to me, a microsecond is like a microsecond, right? It, it, it's very insignificant. So a lot of rare event processes even a microsecond isn't sufficient to do the modeling. The problem, though, is that we don't have very accurate descriptors of how molecules behave even in the first place. So the length and how long you run the simulation, you might get a pretty picture, but you don't necessarily even know that that's the true representation of the system that you're dealing with. Uh, so ideally, the path forward is that you would take quantum mechanics, and use the rules of how electrons move, or even if you wanted to, you could do electronic uh, nuclear simulations as well. Uh, then you generate something called the potential, which basically says how do molecules push and pull with one another. We'll talk about that more when we go into uh, interacting systems. Then we would plug this into a molecular dynamics simulation have the molecules wiggle around, bounce off each other, rotate, all that kind of stuff. And we would use some of the techniques we're going to talk about now to scale up how atomic positions and behaviors correspond to a large-scale macroscopic property that I could then take, grab, and I could throw into uh, a, a, you know, calculations on turbine expanders or something like that. That's the general pathway that is commonly done now in modern sort of molecular or statistical type calculations. But if we didn't have a computer that could do all of this, we still had to reconcile back in the early 1900s atomic concepts and macroscopic concepts. So instead, the approach taken in StatMac is more or less as follows. One, we will define 
a finite and simple system. More or less outline the rules of the game. How many particles are there? How can those particles behave? What's allowed? What's not allowed? The next is we will calculate basic properties. For example, if I have two particles, you know, a certain distance apart, how much energy is that? I'm going to add up all of those interactions and I'm going to come up with the energy of this particular system. The next step is that we then generalize it. Right, so we made the rules for a finite system, but we want to then scale it up to effectively an infinitely sized system, or an arbitrarily sized system. And then lastly, We're going to scale it up to the continuum scale. And that'll give us energies in terms of joules as opposed to 10 to the minus 23 joules. Some actual numbers that we can take and, and run away with. And this, in a nutshell, is the goal of statistical mechanics or statistical thermodynamics. And for some reason, I cannot say statistical. Maybe I need to enunciate more and take my uh, lesson or speech classes or something. Okay, <clears throat> so the goal of what we're trying to do here is relate between a microstate and what we call a macrostate. So a complete description of a microstate. is where we have known positions and known velocities, or momentums, if you want to think of that as well. So in this case here, this r position vector corresponds to an r x, r y, r z position for every single particle in the system. In this case, a particle is a molecule. And same thing for the v. So if we know the positions and the velocities of every single particle in the system, uh, we basically can scale up to whatever arbitrary scale we want. Whereas on the macro state, this is where we're concerned with temperature, pressure, internal energy, enthalpy, all of these properties that we've been relying on now for all of our calculations, but we've had to have relied on measured properties, right? To measure internal energy, we had to know what the C sub V was. To measure enthalpy, we had to know what the C sub P was. The question is, can we take this information and directly calculate C sub V and C sub P, knowing how particles interact with one another, or knowing what the approximations are of the atomic length scale? <clears throat> so the first thing is let's outline a couple of criteria that have to be met in order for the microstate to be consistent with the macrostate. We have to have the same number of particles. They must occupy the same volume or exactly the same container 
in real space. And they must have the same energy. So another way to put it is more or less that you have to have mass conservation, you have to have energy conservation, and basically that they have to exist in the real world. But this should feel sort of very familiar in our fundamental foundation of macro thermo as well. Right? We only had a couple of really key founding principles of macroscopic thermodynamics, namely mass conservation, energy conservation, and the second law of thermodynamics. So one macro state has many microstates. So you can imagine that if I had a bin of, you know, a jar of air, or just the air in this room, on average the properties of this room are not changing if the HVAC is working well, right? Temperature's gonna stay the same, pressure's gonna stay the same, and once we define those two properties, then everything else is locked. Internal energy of the air, enthalpy of the air, Gibbs free energy of the air, all of that is locked into position. But at every point in time, if we were to snapshot the room, we would probably never grab a snapshot where all of the gas molecules were in exactly the same location with exactly the same momentums, right? So even though we have one macroscopic system, there's effectively an infinite number of microscopic organizations where the properties scale up to have exactly the same properties, right? Because there's gas molecules whizzing all around. So one issue here that we've kind of glossed over is that one of the main differences between the macro scale and the micro scale is a concept called distinguishability. Distinguishable versus indistinguishable. So if I don't know how to spell something, you can see just it squiggles out really well, but I think I got these ones down. <clears throat> So on the macro scale, objects are distinguishable, right? I can, I can tell each of you apart, or I could draw a number on every single one of these chairs, and that's not going to change, right? So if this is chair one and that's chair two, if I swap them, that's chair two and that's chair one. I can label and mark things. On the micro scale, particles are indistinguishable. Cannot label an atom. Why can't I label an atom? What is a fundamental foundational principle of quantum mechanics that prevents me from labeling molecules? Not not quite. It's one of these principles. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So on the micro scale, if I have particles one, two, and you know however many, I could say that this particle one has some velocity vector of one, particle two has some velocity vector of two, but this is 100% interchangeable It doesn't matter what I call particle one and particle two, because I can never tell them apart. And as a, as a refresh from a physical chemistry course, what the uncertainty principle basically tells us is that the precision that we can ever measure, either the positions of the momentum, is bound. So the uncertainty, or here sigma in the positions, I'll call it, actually let me keep the nomenclature consistent, I'll call it R. And the momentum, 
is always greater than some fundamental limit. In this case, P is equal to momentum. It's just the mass times by the velocity vector. And H is Planck's constant, which is the minimum quantizable level of energy. So you can never slice energy any thinner than the uh, Planck's constant limit, which is a very small number. So it doesn't really come up in chemical engineering all that much. 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So the uncertainty principle has its origins in the Fourier transfer. So when you're, trans go when you're going from a position space to a momentum space for a wave, that exchange corresponds to what they call a Fourier transform. And so it just works out that the fundamental properties of a Fourier transform are such that if you know something exactly in real space, you have no idea what's going on in Fourier space. So it's actually kind of a really interesting just fundamental a consequence of all particles behaving like waves at the quantum level. So if we were to investigate a system, and let's just imagine that we could label particles here as maybe one, two, and three. If we allowed some time to pass, right, T naught plus some delta T time that has elapsed, we'd be left with the three particles, these are all supposed to be question marks, in entirely different locations. But we would never have any idea of which of those particles where they were originally. Now this is the case if I'm dealing with, let's say, a single component system, like it's only oxygen. I can't tell one oxygen molecule apart from another oxygen molecule. But I can tell apart an oxygen molecule from a nitrogen molecule. Those are distinguishable particles, but all of the nitrogens inside of that are indistinguishable. All the oxygens, those are indistinguishable. Okay. So we're not going to talk too much about quantum mechanics other than as sort of a support to kind of help us out, give a, a good starting basis. Uh, but what we're going to do right now is we're going to talk very briefly about a quantum mechanical a description of a molecule. In this case, a really simple monatomic ideal gas. So if we look at the particle in a box calculation, the uh, E here is the energy. It is a property of some uh, quantum uh, numbers, in this case LX, LY, LZ. And we're not going to go through the derivation, but we'll just spit out the result. This is just a 3D particle in a box, which uh, many of you have likely seen. In this case, L of I is just some integer. Right? Energy levels are discrete and quantized, so these, num these numbers have to be 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to infinity. You can't have 1 and a half. H, as we mentioned, is the Planck's constant. Right? We have some bare minimum indivisible energy level that can't be separated. And so basically what we're doing is we're counting up how many of those we have. Right? That's effectively what this calculation is doing for us. Uh, M is equal to the mass of the particle that we're dealing with. V is the volume of the box that this particular particle is trapped in. And epsilon is the, uh, is the energy level of the state. And this is where we're going to be spending a lot of our time, is talking about what that exactly means. 
So most of you guys, have, I'm sure, have solved for the one-dimensional particle in a box. It's a relatively straightforward calculation. It's just a, a wave where the solution is at a total, there's lots of basically an infinite number of basically frequencies of that wave that satisfy the boundary conditions. This is the same concept, just scaled up uh, to a three-dimensional system. So if we're, what we're going to do is we're going to look at, we're going to call things energy states. Right, and this is the same concept as basically a microstate. And for every single one of those energy states, it's going to have a unique system property. And at the end here, this uh, summation of the Li squared, that's basically as a stand-in. This is proportional to the energy of that system. But instead of writing h squared over 8mv to the 2 thirds every time, I'll just write that. So one energy state that this microstate can be in is if we were to have a particle that had an Lx, Ly, and Lz quantum numbers given by 1, 1, and 2. So if we were to calculate what its effective energy is, we could call that uh, 6, right? 2 squared plus 1 plus 1 adds up to basically, you know, 6 energies worth. But we could also have an entirely equivalent energy state that has exactly the same energy, but the particle has slightly different properties. And lastly, you can see the pattern here. We could have it organized a slightly different way. So what we call this particular system is we call this threefold degenerate, which is defined as there are three states with the same energy. And we usually denote this as omega j. So this is the degeneracy of the J energy level. So there's going to be a fairly large amount of new nomenclature coming up. So to be clear, these are the energy states. An energy state is a unique descriptor where every single particle has a specific property and we're defining that as a microstate of the system. All three of these microstates have the same energy level. So what's really going to happen in the real world is when we're trying to find out what is the average energy, it's going to be a balance between the energy of a particular state and how many different configurations can exist in that energy state. And so those two competing effects will give us the probabilities. And unfortunately, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that math on Wednesday, uh, walking through all of that. OK, so the energy can be classified uh, either as adding up the energy of all the states or figuring out what the degeneracy is times the energy level. Right? So you can either count up all the individual states or for every energy level you can count the degeneracy, the number of ways that rearrangements can happen. So the really traditional way to teach StatMech is a lot of combinatorial probability mathematics. Right? Here's a scenario, this is the energy of the system, how many different ways can you organize all of the particles and all the different bins or spins or whatever the particular specifics of that case are. Right? But the goal is what we're trying to do is come up with a system to organize uh, all of the different possible combinations and configurations because we're going to have to keep track of a lot of them. Uh, so this omega here, uh, this, is for, this is for one particle. We use the capital omega 
degeneracy of a collection of molecules. Okay, so for a collection of molecules, and for right now, we are going to ignore any interparticle interaction because it makes, makes things obviously significantly more complex. So now we're going to try and more or less think of every particle as a discrete entity. Effectively, this is the ideal gas approximation. So we're starting off with the same starting point as what we would have done in a classical thermo approach, right? We're starting off with the ideal gas scenario. We can have N as a vector, which contains all of the whatever individual labels are necessary to define particles 1, 2, 3, 4, and N number of individual particles. So if we write that nj is the number so nj is the number of number of molecules that exist in a particular molecular state. We can write that E of I, which is the energy of the ith microstate, can be given by the formula I'll annotate this a little bit. So this is sum over all states. Okay, let's, let's bring it back to the real world for a second. Okay, so we're in this room and we have lots of gas molecules, or rather, let's say we have a jar with very few gas molecules. What this is basically saying is that in order to know what the total energy, basically what we're calling energy means the internal energy, what is the total energy or what is the total internal energy contained within that jar? If we assume it's in an ideal gas state, it is simply the summation of all of the energies of every individual atom in the system. So this ith microstate could be one instantaneous snapshot of the positions and the velocities of every gas molecule in that jar. Right? But some of the gas molecules are going to be going a little faster, some of them are going to be going a little slower. Right? The speed at which each molecule travels is going to correspond to the J energy state. So every molecule can have a particular set of characteristic properties of how it's zooming around in that particular jar. However many molecules are in that individual state, we add all those up and add up all the different microstates of every individual molecule, and that gives us the total energy of the system. So what this allows us to do is categorize how many molecules are behaving in what way and add it all up. But then, if I let an instant go by and I freeze it again, that's an entirely new microstate of the system. 
I. And then you're going to have an entirely new set of properties, right? You're going to have some inelastic collisions where maybe one molecule gives its energy to another, right? Or maybe the energies collide and they both change. Those are going to correspond to changing in the J, J microstates of the individual atoms. So hopefully we can see how we're kind of building this up to, to categorize things. Okay. So with the last little bit of class, uh, we're going to now talk about the fundamental foundational assumptions that we have to believe is true in order to perform any statistic statistical mechanics calculation. Okay, so these are the, these are the postulates of StatMac. So number one is what we call the equal a priori hypothesis. Oh, sorry, equal a priori probability principle. So a priori means that we have to assume it without any evidence. <clears throat> We have no evidence that this is true other than the assumption seems to work. So that's what the a priori basically means. Uh, okay, so what this is, what this hypothesis or principle says, and I'll, and I'll lead it to individual readings to get the full exact long-winded version. Uh, but the essence of this is that if you have a microstate with the same energy, it must have the same probability. So if you have a microstate that has a particular energy and compare it to another microstate that has an equal amount of energy, right, assuming, of course, same volume, same number of particles, those two states should have an exactly equal probability of occurrence. So this gives us a way to bias against states that are extremely improbable. Right, for the example of, let's say you go down to absolute zero, Right, at, you know that at absolute zero, <clears throat> or rather, well, that's actually the opposite case. So if you go to an infinite temperature, for example, you know that not all particles can be, well, this is entropy again. Now, you know what, scrap that. Never mind, forget that I was talking about this at all. Uh, but basically, yeah, so if you have two microstates with the same energy, they have the same level of occurrence. And number two, we have what we call the ergodic hypothesis. Has anyone heard the term ergodic or ergodicity before? So I suspect that, that once sort of the, the, the terminology is, is understood, you'll, you'll find it popping up quite a bit more. In, in your readings, because it's, it's a very critical hypothesis for basically statmec and all molecular simulations. So, <clears throat> what the ergodic hypothesis tells us is that we can replace time averaged properties with statistical averages. So the ergodic principle, what it basically boils down to is that if I have, in this case, let's say a molecular simulation, right, and we have gas molecules zipping around or, or liquid molecules bouncing into one another in a dense fluid, what the ergodic hypothesis tells us is that if we want to get any macroscopic properties out of the system, we have to sample all of the statistical configurations of the system. So for an MD simulation to be valid, every molecule has to basically sample every possible co configuration that it could be into. Because once it's sampled all of the different positions or all the different velocities, then we know it's settled down into the true equilibrium state. 
But if you haven't sampled all the positions, that means you might be locked into a non-equilibrium configuration. Right? You've locked yourselves into maybe a potential energy well. Or maybe you needed to do some simulated annealing by heating it up and get the molecules to loop around. So if your system is ergodic, that means you have truly sampled all configurations and that your molecules have decided that's the one that I want to be in. That's my equilibrium configuration. So one thing you have to look for, especially in simulations of macromolecules, is this principle is oftentimes not confirmed. They can't say that it's not the right equilibrium configuration, but they certainly have not likely sampled all the possible configurations. Now on the other hand, what we're doing in this class, the statistical mechanics approach, is we're coming from the other direction. We're saying, okay, I'm going to build a game. And I'm going to say that all of my molecules can behave in a particular characteristic way. I need to categorize, organize, tabulate, calculate, whatever you need to do, all of the possible configurations of every single particle in that system. So oftentimes the simple way to do it is to say, I have one molecule that doesn't interact with any others. What are all the possible interstates that it can be in? And so if we go back and look at the particle in a box situation, right, this corresponds to all of the different combinations of LX, LY, and LZ. And actually that's not too bad, right? It's just basically an infinite summation over LX, LY, and LZ. So you have a triple infinite sum, uh, uh, summation, which is what we'll be working on in the next couple days. Right? That is sampling all of the different configurations of a single particle. Then we take all the individual particles, add in a collection of particles, and we say we know every single possible configuration for n number of particles for any possible state that they could ever possibly be in. Cool. So what? That's not the world we live in. Right? The gas molecules aren't organizing themselves and, and statistically sampling it. No, they're just randomly whizzing around based on a time average behavior. So the ergodic principle is critical to StatMech because as soon as we've sampled every single possible configuration, then we know what is the likelihood and energy of every single one of those states and we can come up with the average. So what we've done in essence is we've translated discrete positions, organizations, and configurations to a time averaged property. For example, pressure against a wall. If I have a pressure gauge, I'm not measuring discrete events unless you're extremely low, low pressure. I'm measuring the time averaged force being exerted on that sensor by the gas inside the container. Right, so molecular simulations need to sample all the statistical spaces in order to ensure that they have accurate calculations. And in StatMech, we need to have all the combinatorial statistics worked out to calculate a time average behavior, which is what we really care about, right? When we look at the temperature or the pressure or in any sort of other chemical process, we're measuring a time average result. So with these two principles, basically, this is the foundation of StatMech. In principle, all we do is insert particles into a box where we define the rules of how they can behave. For example, the, the Pauli exclusion principle, that's a rule for how electrons have to behave. In the Pauli exclusion principle, you say, no, no more than two electrons at any energy level. And that also gives rise to basically all the properties of the universe, that one simple rule, right? We're going to do the same exact thing but with particles in a box. We're going to say, no, nope, that particle, that is a monatomic gas. It's spherically symmetric and it only has translational energy versus that's a diatomic molecule. It has vibrational energy, it has translational energy, and it has rotational energy. Those are the rules that we have given those particles. StatMech is the mathematics to figure out Based on the rules that I give that particle, what is its internal energy? What is its heat capacity? And that's the essence of what we're trying to answer over the coming weeks uh, from now to the end of the semester. OK, any questions? So this is a nice overview. We're going to be hitting the math and specifics uh, coming on Wednesday. All right, see you guys.